blessing on his word. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, your word is truth and light to those of us who find it. Anoint your word to each and every ear and each and every heart in this room, that your word might come alive to us and that we might learn to use it when we need it the most in our lives. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen, amen. and amen. Since there's only a handful of us, <laughs> we'll take it a little longer, like a couple hours, no problem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was probably, and probably, I remember, maybe Martha remembers this. When I was about 17 years old, I remember going up to a movie up in Moscow, Vermont, up on the way to Stowe. And it was called, it was about the end times. It was put out by Billy Graham. Do you remember that, Martha? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it talked about, it had the rapture in it, you know, and mm -hmm. all the people were left behind and people that get raptured up. It was quite scary. I went and got a bumper sticker that said, <laughs> in case, this car will be, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. <laughs> <laughs> My father used to come, he says, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you better get saved. Because <laughs> I don't want you left behind. Yeah. I don't get you guys. <laughs> and so whenever you hear that, and when, I, and when I was reading the scriptures, I was reminded of those days, you know, when you were a young Christian and you were, you know, so impressionable, I should tell you, I was very impressionable. <laughs> I remember one day I couldn't find Father Paul around that time after watching that movie, okay? <laughs> I saw him go out a door and then he was gone. I panicked. <laughs> and I thought I was left behind. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's true. <laughs> so, let me read to you the scripture. It's from Matthew chapter 24 for those of you who want to follow along. And I'm going to read from today's but then I'm going to bring you into the context of it, all right? It says, who then, it says, this is starting with verse, chapter 24, make sure I got it right. 24. I think 32 would start at, but let's we'll start. How then learn a parable, of, okay, hold on. Yep, 32, I think. Now then learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know the summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall not pass away, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Remember that. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Remember that. These are keys to understanding these verses. And knew not until the flood came, took them away, so that also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and one left. That reminded me of that movie. <laughs> Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not the hour your Lord does come. But know this, that if the good man of the house knew when, what, he knew in what watch the thief was going to come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. Therefore be ye also ready, in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. In the beginning of the scripture, you'll find that Jesus is leaving the Temple Mount and he's going up to the Mount of Olives. And this is what he's saying to them, all right? Just so you know the context of it. 
Jesus went out and departed from the temple and it, with his disciples and came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they go up to the temple mount and he's showing the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us then what these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed, no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We know the scripture. I just wanted to give you the context. If you read through it, you'll begin to also see that Jesus said, if someone says that Jesus is in the desert, don't believe him. If he says he's coming on some other way, don't believe him. And so we've used these scriptures looking through the lens of, our, of, of the way we think today. Could you imagine that today I said, all right, guys, there's a mountain back here. Let's go up top, and I'm going to show you all the buildings down here, and I'm going to tell you that there's none of them going to be left. And it'll happen in your generation, it says. Think about that. Think about, first of all, you probably would think I'm nuts. Well, you might think that already. <laughs> That's okay. I'll only cry at night when you don't know. <laughs> So you got to think about the context. And he's, these guys don't understand the end, like you and I think of the end. And believe me, the scriptures that we're looking at where one shall be you're grinding and one shall be taken and one shall be left, that the way we think of those things is not the way Christ is portraying them. I'm going to show you. It's important to understand because it has to do a lot with, and it's, I always wondered why these scriptures were here, the very beginning of Advent, the birth of Christ. I want to hear the nice story about the coddly little baby in the manger. And here you have something that brings to my mind death and destruction. So you've got to look through the lens of these guys that are hanging around Jesus and they're having this private meeting on Mount, Ol on the Ol Mount Olivet. And he's looking over Jerusalem, remember? Looking over Jerusalem. And can you imagine that we were sitting there and Ross said to us, In what, within your generation, this will be gone. We would be devastated. But it was only, not, it was in 1940-something that it was actually put back together again in many respects, except for the temple. So it hasn't been that long. So he's standing there on the mount. And it comes to the part where we're reading when he says, when this branch, see, listen to a word, for learn a parable of the fig tree, when this branch is yet tender. Have you ever heard that Jesus is from Nazareth? Do you know what Nazareth means? It means branch. It's a messianic term. This branch. You remember when Jesus was in the temple and he says to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And then, then you see a little subtitle that says they didn't realize they were talking about the temple of his own body. Mm -hmm. Are we bringing this into context now? I mean, we're not listening to those radio stations that you hear you know, out in the Midwest and the South where Death and destruction are coming. Now, I'm not doubting that death and destruction, all you gotta do is turn on the TV and you'll wonder what the heck's going on, but I wanna show you that Christ is talking about something much more intimate for us, for you and me, than just sitting there out there in the world wondering and sitting in your house going, I wonder when the world's going to end. It says you're going to see these things happen, don't be afraid, because men's heart will break with fear because they're hearing these things, but the end is not yet near. That's what it says. So let's bring it back into context. 
So we go down to verse 36. But in that day, an hour, knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Do you know what that means? It means that Jesus hasn't been informed. Huh? How can that be? Because it also says that he and the Father are one. Don't you know? When you see me, you see the Father. How could that be? So what is he talking about? He's talking about the wedding feast of the Lamb. In a Hebrew wedding, when you're about to get married, there's a one-year betrothal period. And the son and the, and the, and the other family and the other families, they, they draw up something called a, I don't say it right, a katab, which is a contractual agreement. It's the Torah of how that relationship is going to operate. It's the instructions and the deal that is made. And then the son goes off to his father's house and builds a room for him and his wife. And he is not allowed to go get his bride until the father tells him. Did you know that? And so when it says that, that this is going to be the way it is, let's we'll read it again. That the day and the hour no man know but not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It's because the Father is the one that makes the decision when the Son is ready to marry his bride. And so you and I in our lives, we are that bride. We are the ones that Christ is coming for. And how is that day going to be? And this is where it gets fun. We think that in the days of Noah, isn't it funny? Jesus starts talking about a wedding. Isn't that the farthest thing you would have ever thought of? But as the days of Noah were so, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When you read about the ark, you see, we think of an ark, right, as a, a boat. And yes, it's a nice boat. I, you remember reading that I used to have this Bible in my house that was that really thick one. It was for the kids, you know, and it had all the great pictures in it because I was too, I didn't like to read. <laughs> and it had the picture of these animals getting inside the ark. And, you know, and I always had an image of, in my mind that only, you know, you count how many people, there was eight people that got into the ark. And then, and then you have, I think in the picture, I have this image at least, I think it's in that Bible where there's people like in the water drowning. <laughs> and I go, how horrible. <laughs> Terrible. You know, and, 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 and the word for an ark okay, is teva. You've heard me talk about it before. If you were to go to Israel and you ask about a word, they would say a teva. It means a word. Now, you think that, why is the ark, we think of the ark of the covenant also, that's in the holy of holies, right? That's called an aron, okay, which means a coffin, which brings up a whole other things. I mean, you, you're kidding me, right? That a coffin is in the middle, that's where God's presence dwells? We'll teach on that someday. We'll leave you hanging with it. <laughs> but the teva means a word. And so, what did Jesus say? Where did it go? Let's see what it says. It says here, I just want to make sure I do it. But a word, okay, in your life is how you're going to be able to rise above the situations in your life. Because what does the ark do? There's eight people that get into the ark. The number eight in scripture means above nature. It means to be above the circumstances of life. 
And they get into the ark, which is pitched, which is made of wood, okay, and, we, and it has three different levels, and these were all the animals get into. And as they get into that, God closes the ark. I'm just paraphrasing the whole thing quickly. And they get into what? If a teva is a word, what are you doing when you get into the ark? You're getting into the word. All right? And I'm not talking about just this word that you see on a book. Because this word here is not the word of God. Huh? Oh my God. He's her heresy. <laughs> this is a witness to the word. Because where is the word supposed to be? In you. Right? So what do we do? Uh, this is the word. No, this is the witness to the word. Because when you're reading it, you're supposed to be doing what? Bearing witness to it. <laughs> right? Because it's in you. And so you get into the word. Where are you going then? In yourself, inside, where God is going to do what? Help you to rise above the circumstances of your life. To prepare you for what? The wedding feast of the Lamb in your life. So when Jesus was speaking to the, to the apostles that day on the, uh, on the Mount of Olives, he was reminding them, of how God is going to work in their lives. And if you hear about rumors of war, it's not here yet. Because why? You have to be in the ark. And you have to go through that time. How many days did it rain? Anybody remember? Forty. Forty. How long does it take from the time that, a, that an egg is fertilized before... 40, how many? Weeks. 40 weeks. How many t years was it from the time that the children of Israel left Egypt before they could enter the promised land? 40. 40. That's correct. And I always love this. But the patriarchs' wives, have you ever noticed how they had trouble having babies? Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Why? Why? You see, you don't have to be a theological genius to understand the word of God. All you have to do is look for the patterns. Just like I was showing Tim the other day, right? Wasn't it? I tried to draw a leaf, right? Terrible job, didn't I? <laughs> you look at the back of the leaf and what do you see? A pattern, right? In everything in life, there are patterns. All around you, there are patterns. And those patterns are speaking to your life because within you is what? The Word of God is in you. And when Christ is born into your life, what takes place? It says a born-again experience, right? That means you do what? You wake up. You, oh my gosh. I'm alive. I mean, even the toilet paper at that moment is going the right direction every single time. <laughs> you know, when you have that waking up experience, the grass is greener. The sky is bluer because you're waking up. But he's preparing you by getting you into the pattern of his word so that as you get into that pattern, you now are strengthened from within because what was going on during Noah's time? What were they preparing for? A flood. And guess what? They'd never seen one. They had no idea. He just, I mean, for a hundred years, he built this ark. I mean, with no idea what it was going to do because they were in an area there was not no giant body of water. Talk about faith. Talk about getting into the word and this doesn't make any sense. But that's what God is teaching you and I to do in our lives. To get our eyes off. If you read the scripture, it says get your eyes off of the outside things and get them on the inside things where I dwell, where the word of God is alive in you. 
Because when you do that, God begins to do a work within you. If you think that God is on the outside, you've got another thing coming to you. You're going to be sorely disappointed. And you are going to be on the mountain with Jesus and the disciples when they say, oh, it's all going to be destroyed. Guarantee you, it will be. Nothing will be left. Because why? The only thing that truly is going to be left it says in the Word, that's what I was trying to find you because I asked you to remember it, is His Word. Because He is the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And so if you're going to learn to live in this world, you've got to learn to be not of this world. And that means by getting into the Word. And I'm talking about not just getting into and becoming a Bible scholar because you can go on YouTube and find a million Bible scholars who have no idea, who've never experienced the Word of God in their life. And it always blows my mind. I don't understand. How can they not know? How can they not experience what Jesus does for you? And they went to seminary. I mean cemetery. I mean seminary. <laughs> So what God is looking for in our lives is to bring us into the point where we're prepared for that wedding feast because Jesus is your bridegroom. The Father is the one who initiates that, that wedding when everything is prepared. And that's when the Holy Spirit, which is the bridal party, goes out and gets the bride and brings her where? Home, into the house where they're going to do what? Have a great night, a, a great party, a feast, and then what? Create another family. And that's what our job is to do. Now, I always wondered, let's go back to this part. And know not, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Huh? I mean, where does this come from? This is the same red letters that keep going. What does that mean? Do you know that in you there is a duality? Do you know what I mean by duality? There are two of you. That's what, that's what my Bible teaches me. I'm not sure which one you read. There's two of you. Paul talks about the inner man, and I know you've been hearing me say this since the day I showed up on, this, on these doorsteps. And I will continue to do it, because if you don't catch this message, you will be lost. Because that inner man is the one who is redeemed. Because what does your Bible teach you about this? It doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. The one that inherits it is that inner man, that inner person. And I wish that I could show you even deeper, but I would probably lose everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to do with the number 40. I'm going to give you a clue to it. Why was it that the patriarch's wives had to have their wombs open in order for them to give birth? And why was it that the Messiah could not be born unless he was born from what? A closed womb. This is the mystery. And the mystery is, is that you and I have a closed womb within us. That inner man is the closed womb. That is the part of you that the word of God says, one shall be taken and one shall be left. Are you seeing that now? One shall be taken, and one shall be left. It's not like I saw in 1977. <laughs> movie from, from Waiting for the Rapture. My poor father getting scared that he might get left behind. I don't think he worried too much. <laughs> <laughs> but my father taught me one thing. When he was in a coma... This is how I learned it. Unfortunately, it was a very sad situation when he broke his neck. And he was actually speaking scripture. 
He was praying with people. And then when he finally woke up, and I says, Dad, do you know what you were doing? Give me a break. <laughs> I even got a phone call from a pastor in Aiken, in, in, down in Aiken that said, you got to see what's going on here. I mean, your father's sitting here like he knows scripture. And he's praying with people and asking people to pray with him. And he's in a coma. Figure this out. And I realized that there's more to man that meets the eye. You see, that inner man, that's the one that lives with God. That's the one that lives in the word. And let me show you what that word is. That's the one that is taken into the kingdom of God, which, by the way, is, is part of a body in you. And I want to show you in your life, you know this intimately. You know why? Because you are going through the word in your heart and mind emotionally on a daily basis. And we've learned how to do it in a negative way, but we cannot, we struggle with understanding how to do it in a positive way. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, i got so many problems in my life. What am I going to do? That's the word in the negative. That's the destruction that comes in your life because your words, when struck with emotion, do not remind you of things. They precede you into the future to meet you. And what you have in your life is a result of the inner word that's going on. That's why a teva is a word, not the word. Everybody get that? So one will be taken and one will be left behind. You and I are coming into that place where we conceive in that closed womb. National, was it National Enquirer? You know, they had that guy, remember, that was having a baby? <laughs> and it was a miracle? <laughs> no. The miracle is that Christ is born in you. And that thou, he is the word that becomes flesh in your life. Because you can have an idea. But if that idea doesn't become flesh, what is it? Well, I call it Disney World. <laughs> it's a fantasy then, isn't it? But if it becomes flesh, an idea, if you're going to build a building, right? And you have an idea of that building, right? And you go, what are you going to do with that idea? Well, you're going to sit around and go, well, I have this really great dream of an idea, right? And then you might have an idea for a business idea. You know, ever had that? You know, you had this great idea and you're watching television and you're sitting there, you know, drinking your iced tea. And you say, that was my idea. <laughs> what was the difference between the guy that's on television with the idea and you? They put the idea into action, didn't they? And you're still sitting on your couch drinking iced tea. Maybe a beer, who knows? <laughs> but what did you do with that idea? You're going to take that idea and you're going to nail it. Follow me. You're going to bring it to the cross. The cross is where God takes what is from heaven and he brings it to earth. I rest my case. God became man that man might become the sons and daughters of the living God. And so we've got to learn to control. Did you know that your imagination and your memory work within the same structure of the hippocampus? I don't know, I'm probably going too medical. They work together. Your memory, okay, is scattered throughout. And what happens is uh, memories are made by emotion. And when you emotionally remember something, whether it's negative or positive, there's a spattle memory that gets scattered throughout your brain. Your imagination brings it together. And it has the ability, when you merge it with faith, and you take the word and you focus it, you will bring those things that are invisible into the invisible world. That's what Christ is showing us. Because why? He is the word made flesh. 
have I gotten too deep? <laughs> a little bit? Shall we get some boots? <laughs> that means that if you sit around in your brain and you're going, well, I don't know how I'm going to get through this one. Instead of, what would you do? You would see that God has already done it. It is a finished work at the cross. It is finished. Everything that was ever created is finished. And so you and I now have the ability in Christ to live a redemptive lifestyle. And not become what? Victims. 40 years in the desert. It took 40 years for Israel. It took only a, three, a few days to get out of, out of Egypt, right? But it took 40 years to take Egypt out of Israel. 40. How many years is it going to take us before our eyes are open? And they had the opportunity to enter into the promised land long before the 40 years were up. But what happened? Oh, there's giants in the land. Oh, they could kill us. We're, the, we're like grasshoppers to them. Right? How many times in your life have you viewed yourself as a grasshopper in the midst of the giants of your life? In the midst of the Nephilim? And we think they might come from another planet. That was Zechariah's kitchen book. You read it, they actually came from you. The, all the enemies of Israel, you can trace their roots back to the mistakes that were made in the Old Testament. Every one of them. All seven enemies of Israel that lived with the Canaanites, the Perizzites. I can't name them all. And so you and I, we now have been given an opportunity to be able to live where? In the word of God. And that God's word would precede us. That the Father would call you forth into a place where you now can live your life above what? How many were in the ark? Eight. Above nature. God is able to do everything that you ask for or imagine. When you read the life of Christ, you see that this man was above nature. There was no way that he could do the things that he did if he was not living in the word of God. I mean, walking up to a litter in name to a young boy who was mother was weeping. And what happens? You, you try that someday. <laughs> I remember a guy in Jamaica tried it. Remember Brother Christopher? His wife died, put her in a church, and they prayed until she rose from the dead. She didn't rise from the dead. <laughs> and it was an embarrassment. When you walked down there, the whole town was talking about this guy. Now, I'm not saying don't go, stop praying for the dead. What I'm saying is that God is teaching us about an inner walk. That God has designed a pattern for you and I to come into the word of God. To come into the wedding feast of the Lamb. And to begin to live a life that is not based on the outside world. But is based on what's going on in the kingdom of God. Which is in, in, which is in you. God says in his word in Revelations, it's for them that overcome. And how do you overcome? I'm going to do it myself. No. No. You're going to do what? You're going to depend on the word of God in your life. And it's not the witness of the word. This only bears witness to what's going on inside of you. It's because it's come alive inside of you. It has a revelation knowledge. What did Paul say? I pray that you would grow, all of you would grow in grace and in revelation knowledge. Coming into the knowledge of Jesus Christ who is the word made flesh in your life. That's what Christmas is all about. Praise God. So God is able. There's nothing impossible for him. He is able. And if you allow that word to go out, you will see miracles upon miracles upon miracles taking place. And I will hear testimonies upon testimonies upon testimonies in these pews. 
And I will know it because I'll bear witness to the fact that the word has come alive in every one of you. Lord. And me too. Lord. That's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to have a nice religion. He doesn't want us to have a nice little baby Jesus in a nice little manger. He wants us to have revelation knowledge. And, and, and our founder, one of our founders of our own community was St. Francis of Assisi. The most famous story was him doing what? Holding an invisible Jesus in his arms. And his, his disciples going, is he okay? <laughs> But he knew that in his arms was Christ. And he tried to tell the story. And that's why you have the crush today. Because he had that revelation knowledge during a time when the church was so corrupt. He had a born-again experience. And it's those moments in time in the history of the world that reveals to us that it's that Born again experience that not only changes you from within, but it changes the world around you. So this Advent, don't come to Christmas just to get a nice gift under the tree. Come to Christmas with Christ being born in you and you being empowered to become the sons and daughters of the living God. Christ lives in you and that he is born in you just like the patriarchs. You have to pray to get that womb open. You have to participate to get that womb open. And it is Christ who is born from a closed womb. And may the Lord add a blessing to his word. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, truly your word is truth to us. You've instructed us in your way. And then, Lord, these patterns that you show us in our lives, we're able, no matter who we are, to be able to begin to understand your love for us because it's revelation knowledge that happens from within. We pray, O oh Lord God, that this Advent season, that not only will we be waiting for that moment in our life, but we will experience it and that we will learn to work with it in our everyday life. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.